Uh, good morning or afternoon. My name is Joanna Friesner and I'm the coordinator and executive director for the North American Arabidopsis Steering Committee, which I'll refer to as NASC. I want to welcome each of you to the first talk in the new series we're calling My Plant Biology Story. I'm thrilled today that our speaker is Dr. Jose Deneni, a professor of biology at Stanford University. Before I introduce Jose, I want to go over just a few logistics and housekeeping items. First, I am recording the presentation with, with Jose's permission so that it can be shared on our new Arabidopsis community group website. I will also send a follow-up email to everyone who's registered with the link for the recording so that you can watch it if you missed the Q&A or if you wanna share it with your friends and colleagues. So about the structure of today's seminar. Following this brief introduction, Jose will give an approximately 20 to 25 minute presentation with slides. During this time, I ask that you hold your questions and comments and save them for the Q&A for when he's finished. This will allow him to present his story without interruption. You may want to write your question on a piece of paper next to your computer so that you remember it. There will be plenty of discussion time and I will open the chat for questions and comments when he is finished. I also have several questions that were submitted during the registration process and I plan to get to at least some of those today. I will moderate the submitted questions and do my best to get to everyone within our time frame. This call will be up to an hour long, um, ending at 10 a.m. Pacific time or 1 p.m. Eastern. However, please feel free to leave earlier if you need to. So a brief introduction to this series. NASC developed this series because we want to hear the real story of plant biologists that we admire so much. And we wanna go deeper than a typical science talk that you might attend at a conference or even a seminar at your institution. We wanna find out what led you to plant biology? What were your inspirations? What is your unique background and your experiences that led to you to where you are today? And what about your career? What challenges did you face to pursuing your goals? How did you overcome them? Are you still working through challenges today or is everything wonderful now that you're at this point in your life. Who's helped you? Was it your family, your peers, your mentors? And what do you look forward to next in your career? We are calling the series, My Plant Biology Story, because each of us has a unique and interesting story. We also recommend, welcome your recommendations for future speakers. You can add them to the chat later, or you're welcome to email me directly uh, later on when I send the Zoom link. We hope you enjoy today's presentation. If you would like to learn of the next speakers in our series, please be sure to sign up to be a member of the new Arabidopsis community group. It's free to join. I'll post the URL later. It's also pretty easy to remember. It's arabidopsiscommunity.org. There will be more upcoming member events, including career and skill building events, some of which are being planned by the various committees on NASC, including the Early Career Scholars Subcommittee. I will include the membership sign up link in the chat later and also when I send out the link. Now is time to hear from Jose, Jose Dineni. My very brief introduction, saving most of it for him, is to, again, he's a currently a professor of biology at Stanford University, and he has worked with some of the top names in the plant biology field, including Detlef Weigel when he was at Salk, Marty Yanofsky at UC San Diego, and P Phil Benfi at Duke University. I don't wanna to give too much of his story away, so I will stop there and let Jose take over. Welcome Jose, and thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you very much, Joanna, um, for that kind introduction, and, and also you know, for, for being a fantastic steward of this um, really important scientific community. Um, we all owe you a great, uh, de definite large uh, debt of gratitude um, for the, the decades of, of service that you've provide this, provided this community. So thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that goes smoothly. Okay, and so you can see my slide and you can see my cursor. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to give you an uh, uh, introduction to myself, um, my personal history, 
and uh, different professional steps that, that led me along the way. Um, so I, I titled this A Life in Science Through, Through My Eyes. Um, so uh, this is by no means exhaustive. Uh, I was remarking to Joanna that, you know, I've, I've given some similar presentations in the past, um, but they were earlier in my career, and I realized I'm getting older because the presentation is getting longer and, and perhaps too long. So I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Okay, so, you know, at some level, why did you come here? Well, you want to get a sense of, you know, how did I get to where I am? But, you know, that can be kind of dry. So what you really want is my origin story, right? What, what spider bit me, um, to, <laughs> what plant bit me, uh, to allow me to, to get to where I am, and what are the, you know, bits of thoughts and advice on, on how, you know, my experience might uh, inform or reflect upon um, the, the experiences that you have. So uh, hopefully you'll find some aspect of, of what I talk about relevant to your own experiences, uh, and, you know, I'm happy to uh, elaborate on anything that you want to go into greater depth uh, in the Q&A. Okay, so what's my origin story? Well, as with a lot of stories, it starts with a, well, two, two, two hippies, <laughs> an island, and a boat. So uh, my mother, let's see if that comes up. Oops, why is that? Here we go. Okay, so my mother was born in Acapulco, Mexico, uh, and uh, her family uh, actually originated from Mexico City. So uh, and uh, my grandparents were in a, a resort town, Acapulco, um, essentially working at a hotel. Uh, and they had uh, met a, uh, a rich uh, sailor uh, who uh, really enjoyed the, the food that my grandfather was cooking. And so he sponsored my family to, uh, to move to Los Angeles, uh, my grandmother as a maid and my grandfather as the cook of the house. Um, and that's what brought uh, the Mexican side of my family to the U.S. On uh, my father's side, so my father, uh, John Dinity, uh, he's uh, Irish and Lithuanian, um, and his parents uh, moved to uh, New York, uh, and that, that's where he grew up. And then later on, he, he moved up to upstate New York, uh, where they lived in a small town called Venetia, um, which is pretty cute and is also close to a lot of outdoor uh, areas, the Catskills, and that's where he, he developed a very strong love of nature and, and something that has been passed on to me. But they, you know, met during the uh, early, early 70s. Um, they decided to drop out of their, their careers and professions. So my, my mom was training to be an accountant. Uh, my dad was an airplane uh, mechanic. And they left all of that to buy a sailboat, and they would sail between California and, and Florida. And this was a really sort of fun lifestyle for them. And uh, they did all sorts of crazy things like hunt for treasure in the Caribbean. Uh, they even um, apparently got captured by Cubans one time as they passed too close to Cuban waters. Um, so a lot of a lot of adventure. Um, but perhaps they had too much fun because I'm. Fairly sure I was probably conceived on a boat because they lived on a boat. Uh, and I was born uh, in Key West, Florida in 1978. So my father was quite an adventurous person. He hadn't gone to college, but he's uh, self-trained in all sorts of different things, including uh, flying airplanes and being an airplane mechanic. Um, and it was uh, soon after uh, the family moved uh, actually to, to New York that he continued some of uh, his activities in Florida. And what he was doing, uh, unbeknownst to us, was actually flying uh, shipments of, of marijuana and other drugs between Florida and South America. Um, and of course, <laughs> that's, that's, that's illegal. Um, uh, these are not family photos, by the way. These were uh, taken uh, from, from the internet. Um, but you know, these activities you know, ultimately landed him in jail. So he was in prison uh, for nine years. Uh, and was basically uh, sort of, you know, removed from, from my life, uh, most of my adolescence. So obviously that was really traumatic for the family. And uh, we ultimately moved um, to the West Coast where my mother's family was. And so we moved in with uh, the Lopez family. Um, so where we lived was in, in Reseda. Um, if you look at it by Google Maps, it doesn't look pretty that, that, that interesting. It's 
um, these uh, this large suburb. So San Fernando Valley is one of the largest suburbs in the world. Uh, and I think the only the two things that Reseda is, is is famous for, if it's famous for anything, um, there's a line in a in a uh, Tom Petty song that mentions Reseda. Um, but also it uh, was uh, brought up in, in the Karate Kid, the original Karate Kid. And there's this fun scene where the um, future girlfriend of the Karate Kid is, is talking to her father at the country club. And uh, he, yeah, he says, uh, I've, or she says, I've got, to, I've got to go. Oh no, the father says, I've got to go. Do you have a date? And she says, with whom? A, a friend. Um, and then he says, not that boy from Reseda. And then she says, yeah, he's from Reseda, but he's a nice guy, so it's no big deal. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the other guy from Reseda um, in, in addition to the Karate Kid. So interestingly, my family, uh, the Mexican side of my family, of course, moved to uh, Reseda and to Los Angeles in a very different time um, than, than it is today. So if you go to Los Angeles and Fernando Valley now, it's so diverse, so many different cultures mixing together. But in the 1950s, it was a very different place. And uh, I think this influenced how my uh, grandparents and my parents, uh, my mother, viewed the, the, how their culture fit in, in, into, this, into this location. And so um, uh, uh, sort of uh, adapting and, and, and also um, sort of adapt, uh, acclimating to the, the, the culture, uh, dominant culture at the time was, was uh, important to them. And so surprisingly, even though I grew up in a Mexican family where uh, most of the time they spoke uh, Spanish to each other, I didn't learn Spanish um, because they didn't talk to me in Spanish. And my grandparents uh, went to night school uh, to learn English in order to speak to me. But of course, times changed. Uh, the area became much more diverse. Uh, that's me uh, in this picture. Um, and uh, it was you know, a really, uh, interesting experience growing up as a, as a Mexican American, but not knowing Spanish. And I would say that was actually a really, really important thing in my life. Um, not necessarily something that I, I value or disvalue, but something that changed my perspective and, and how other people viewed me. Because even though, uh, you know, I, I look Mexican, um, my family was Mexican, when I opened my mouth, it was clear I didn't know Spanish. And, and so that was uh, really a bit ostracizing. I didn't really fit in to the Mexican American community. I didn't really fit in with any other community. Um, and so I had to find my, my own way. Now, as I was going through school, I you know, thought I had some intelligence, but I didn't really um, apply myself. And I, I didn't really know what it meant to sort of work hard and, and, and try to accomplish anything in particular. Um, and, you know, I think part of this was, was in gaining self-confidence. And it was, I remember, it was a very specific moment. Uh, I was taking AP biology in high school and the, the teacher asked, you know, some really esoteric question, you know, what is the chemical bond between, you know, nucleotides in, in, in DNA? And, you know, normally I wouldn't have known what that was, but the previous night I had decided, well, maybe I'm going to look at the textbook and try to study a little bit. And I remember that bond because it was just such a weird word, phosphodiester bond. Um, and so I raised my hand. I said, uh, phosphodiester bond. And then, you know, no one really thought, you know, much of me at that point, but they all looked around like, who, who knows that? Who, who knew it was phosphodiester bond? Um, and so that gave me a bit of confidence because it made me feel that, uh, well, then maybe I'm actually good at something. Maybe I can, you know, remember the, the facts and details of, of biology in a way that allows me to, to apply myself in a way that I hadn't before. So that moment was, was really uh, encouraging and um, changed the trajectory of, of my uh, later science classes that I was taking uh, in high school. And, you know, ultimately uh, led me to uh, achieve, you know, uh, enough to be able to apply to, to UC Berkeley and to go there as an undergraduate. So in 1996, I, I started as an undergraduate uh, at Berkeley. And, you know, even though it's, you know, just a difference between Northern and Southern California, it felt like an entirely new world. Um, the beautiful uh, stately buildings of Berkeley really make you feel like you're, you're in a place where 
thinking and learning happens. Um, so it was really just um, uh, a humbling experience to, to be able to, to, to make it there. Um, but then also, uh, you know, a bit of counterculture there uh, and, and, and individuals in the community surrounding Berkeley uh, that is, it was very different than, than what I'd experienced in Los Angeles. So um, all of that was, was eye-opening and is, is uh, you know, captured my attention um, for my entire life. Now, you know, while I had started to, you know, figure out how to do well in school, it was, uh, you know, doing an undergraduate degree at Berkeley is, is, is nothing like uh, what it took to, to do well in, in high school. Um, and I didn't really have all of those kind of mental support structures and strategies for, for doing well. I didn't, I didn't have to in, in high school because um, largely it was just a holding ground for children. Um, and so when I got to Berkeley, I didn't, I didn't really know how to study, and I took a bunch of courses, and I didn't really do that well. And the one that really stings the most is, is the B minus in, in logic. Um, I, I thought I was some sort of uh, half-assed philosopher, or I, I know I was a Trekkie and, and really appreciated uh, Spock as a character. And so it was, it was really, uh, um, it felt bad to, to get that, that grade in, in logic. Um, and so, you know, it was really hard because you look around yourself and you see people, you know, um, partying or, or, or doing whatever, and they don't seem to really be working hard to, to get the grades that they need. And of course, a lot of people that make it to these elite universities um, have had training uh, that prepares them in, in ways that, that don't for a lot of other students. And, and so I had to learn to, to set my own standards and to, to realize that really, you know, no one makes it without hard work. Um, it may be hard work that they're doing now or preparation that has been provided to them, um, but you don't do well unless, unless you work hard. And so I had to work hard to, to make things happen. And my second semester, I, I did much better. So that brought me a lot of confidence. And, and then I you know, entered into uh, uh, doing undergraduate research uh, during that time. And also I entered into plant biology. And one of the most influential plant biology courses I took was uh, plant morphology from Donald Kaplan, who's, who's now passed away. And he really emphasized the power of observation. Uh, I think it's really important that we become kind of, you know, as, as, as biologists, really intimately aware and familiar with the organisms that, that we study, where they grow, the climates they're from, uh, natural history of those, those organisms, what related organisms do, right? And, and all of this can be influenced just by careful observation and that kind of patient meditation on, on, on the organism um, was something that I, I really valued during this time. I entered uh, as an undergraduate in the lab of, of Robert Fisher, um, who's, who's now uh, emeritus, uh, and he, he studied uh, seed development. Um, but what really uh, in, has inspired me since is how much opportunity he gave me. So during my time there, I was essentially working, you know, as an independent researcher on, on a project that I had ultimately defined for myself. And that opportunity that he gave me, um, you know, based on the hard work that I had put in, um, obviously changed, changed my life. Um, and it wasn't easy. Uh, I came in not knowing really what it took. And, and so it took careful mentorship as well to help see me through. And, and there, I really want to thank Ramin Yadagari, who's now a professor at uh, University of Arizona, um, because he he had he had he had high standards for me, um, which meant that I grew a lot. Right? It wasn't always easy um, to meet those high standards, but I at least I knew that you know if I could accomplish the tasks set set before me. Um, that, you know, I'd be able to actually, you know, learn something substantial. And, you know, ultimately, the, the work that I, I started in the lab helped to lead to my first publication. So I was, uh, I had taken pictures of these mutants uh, uh, called Medea that led to a fertilization independent seed development, which was one of these really cool and far out um, phenotypes that, that was, um, uh, that the lab had identified. And that gave me, you know, real, real sense of pride. I had, I had stuck with the research long enough. So I was in the lab for about two years. Um, I stuck with the research long enough that I could see this, this pattern of success and failure play out. Um, and it took a while. I'd say that, you know, that first year was really a struggle. 
because you know, on an exam, a 90% is an A, but on a protocol, that's a fail. It doesn't work if you only do 90% of the steps properly. And, and that took a lot of, a lot of um, uh, soul searching for me to accept that sometimes things have to be, you know, uh, basically perfect in order for them to work. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, that's ultimately why a lot of experiments fail. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to accept that failure. And I think the only way that I can personally accept such failure is if I, if I know, if I have a, a pretty good guess that there's going to be success at, at the other end of the road. Okay, so at this point, I was feeling, you know, pretty confident uh, in, in my abilities to, to do uh, plant research. I had gotten my name on a paper, and I had headed down to San Diego uh, to UCSD to uh, pursue my PhD. And it was here where I started to study uh, flower development and uh, study how uh, uh, different growth processes uh, pattern the, the growth of tissues in, in different organs um, to, to reveal their, to, to generate the different shapes um, that are observed in the plants. Um, and it really gave me this opportunity to both explore molecular genetic approaches to understanding plant development, um, but also, again, to, to uh, spend time carefully observing uh, how plant organs grow, what genes are important for that, what happens when you have defects in these growth regulatory processes, um, and how to interpret uh, a mutant phenotype to, to you know, get a, an accurate you know, guess or hypothesis as to what that gene is doing. Along the way, of course, I had lots of you know, fantastic mentors, but mentors that provided me part of the puzzle, right? I think often we want to see everything that we need in our mentors, right? But everyone's human. We all have our faults. We all have our pluses and minuses. And so I think it was actually a, a blessing that I had two mentors doing during my PhD. So I initially started my lab or my work in, in Detlef's lab when he was at the Salk Institute. And I joined his lab one because he was doing such just beautifully innovative work. Um, and you could just see the passion and enthusiasm that he had for his science, you know, exuding out when he'd walk through the lab, asking what people were doing. It just raised everyone's uh, spirits. Um, and also, he's incredibly, you know, innovative and takes uh, challenges. So he's, you know, gone from a developmental biologist in flies to a developmental biologist in, um, in plants, and then is now essentially an evolutionary uh, biologist and ecologist. Um, and so he's, he's always up for the challenge. But this is really wonderfully complemented by my other mentor, uh, Marty Yanofsky. So when Detlef decided to move his lab to Germany, I was initially really excited. But during that time, I met my partner, uh, who would ultimately become my wife, uh, Andrea. And it was uh, during that time that I realized I, I couldn't go to Germany. It was, it was uh, not the most important thing to me. Um, and so I decided to, to stay and to continue the relationship. And I joined uh, and transferred my project over, over to Marty's lab. And there, I could really, for the first time, see uh, kind of a father in action um, in, a, in a way that was, you know, really important for my own development uh, as, as, you know, what I would say is, as, a, as a husband and a, and a father. Um, so Marty had a, a happy family life. He had a successful lab. He wasn't in the lab from you know all hours of the day. He had very strict work a working schedule, um, and that showed me that you know you don't have to um, give it all up to to do good science. That that you can have a happy family and a successful lab. It's a challenge and it's a struggle, um, but but both are possible. So I was looking for postdocs then uh, at, during, uh, after, you know, towards the end of my graduate school. And I was interviewing with a number of people that were essentially doing similar work as, as, as I was during grad school. And I remember this very important moment. I was uh, talking to uh, Jennifer Nemhauser, who at the time was a postdoc in Joanne Corey's lab. And I was telling her about my experience, you know, searching for a postdoc. And she just looks at me and says, why don't you get out of your comfort zone? And well, at the time, at the moment, you know, of course, it was like, Ooh, uh, 
what is I, I, you know, I thought I, I thought I was challenging myself. I, I wasn't, you know, but I thought I was. Um, that really opened up my eye and, and, and made me think more carefully about, well, what is the purpose of the postdoc? What do I want to get out of it? And how can I get out of my comfort zone? And so then I opened, broadened my search a little bit more and looked at uh, uh, Philip Benthi's lab, who is at, at Duke University. Um, so Duke is in North Carolina, which, you know, for a Californian, that's like the deep south. <laughs> that's a very, a very different place. Um, and, you know, the only thing I knew about the South was what I saw on, in, in movies. Um, so it was, you know, for, for a time, you know, somewhat intimidating to think about um, actually moving there. Um, but, you know, his work was fantastic and the people in his lab were happy and the location was beautiful. Uh, and so after taking a trip and then having an interview there, I decided to join as a postdoc. And, and it was uh, just one of the most fantastic experiences of my life. Um, it was a fantastic group, really um, beautiful colleagues, wonderful people. Um, and I got to experience, I think, one of the most kind of uh, uh, thoughtful mentorship experiences I've, I've had so far, because Philip is really mindful in, in, in how he, he, he runs his lab. And he's very professional. He's, he's, he's read books on, on things like how to, how to manage groups. And, and as a consequence, you know, it really uh, trickled down to people in the lab. We treated each other with respect and admiration, uh, and it was just a wonderful working environment. And it was also great to see how, in, how you know, innovative um, you know, and, how, and how technology could be brought into uh, the process of, of plant science. Um, now, my postdoc was fairly short. It was, it was two and a half years, um, but enough time to uh, be able to put together a project that um, you know, was was uh, so sort of shiny and, and flashy. We, we ultimately established the, the first uh, cell type specific transcriptional map of an environmental stress response. Uh, and together with with Terry Long, uh, who was uh, the co first author, uh, we uh, looked at both salinity and, and iron stress uh, in in this paper. And so this, you know, I think we you know we 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 have to be very mindful about. Uh, you know, where papers are published and, you know, that, that we need to, you know, focus on the science and not the place that it was published. But certainly at this time, it was, it was important that it was published in science. And it ultimately helped me to get my position uh, in, in, in Singapore. Singapore? What? <laughs> Why are we going to Singapore? Well, the same reason that I didn't go to Germany is the same reason I went to Singapore. So uh, my partner had a uh, graduate fellowship that required her to go back to Singapore to uh, do a four-year postdoc or pay $700,000. And so when she had to go, I had to go. And so I did my postdoc and then moved all the way to Singapore. And at the time, I barely knew where it was. You can see it here in this little red dot. I have to make the dot a little bit bigger so that you can see where the island is. It's completely covered by the, by the dot now. Um, but it was this, you know, really uh, exciting opportunity. Of course, um, you know, for personal reasons, I needed to go. But it was a really exciting time to move to Asia. So it was about, it was 2008. The Beijing Olympics were happening that summer. Uh, the uh, economy in Southeast Asia was, was still booming, even though the U.S. economy at that time had collapsed. So there are a lot of positive things. And, and Singapore itself is one of these, you know, um, uh, efficiently run um, uh, locations with all sorts of technology and, and beauty and, and multicultural experience. Um, the, cap the, the pictures don't capture that it's, you know, hotter than heck and, and humid uh, as your mouth, but um, it's, it's beautiful and, and the food is, 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 is wonderful. So I got to, you know, experience the island. I got to understand my wife's culture uh, more, um, and I started my lab. Um, so I, I started the lab at the Tomasic Life Sciences uh, Laboratory, um, and I learned that even though I had lots of resources there, uh, the research culture really wasn't as as engaging and supportive as as I had hoped. Um, and you know, going abroad is really important because it helps you to not only know, you know why uh, some of the things in your own home country 
uh, might not be that good, but also what things you should value from your experience uh, back home. And I really appreciate the, the research culture uh, in the US and um, was wanting to, to move back home. But before I did that, uh, we had some children. <laughs> so nine months uh, into my term in, uh, in Singapore, we had uh, our first son, uh, our, our firstborn uh, Samuel. Uh, and then uh, about a, a year and a half later, uh, we had uh, our, our first daughter, Marie. Okay, so I hightailed it back home and was really fortunate to be able to get a position at the Carnegie Institution uh, for Science and, and there set up a really uh, wonderful, beautiful group, uh, re researchers with all sorts of different expertise. And, and this allowed us to really open up our science, explore uh, the use of different imaging techniques, robotics, uh, you name it, um, and to do it in, in what I'd say is one of the most wonderful locations um, on earth. Um, the Bay Area is just beautiful uh, and wonderful. So when I got there, uh, the director who was there at the time, Wolf Brummer, hired me, um, and he really showed me, you know, what what a leader a leader can be, um, because what he did is he really supported you. When I came there, I felt 100% confidence in my ability to to get things done, and and he gave me all the resources that I need um, to to accomplish that. And so I felt fully supported and able to take risks that I wouldn't have been able to take before. He also gave great advice on grants, and I'll give that to you now. Um, so he said, you know, submit the grant application that you want to get funded, not necessarily the project that you most want to work on. Well, at first, it sounds kind of odd. Well, why wouldn't you just apply for what you want to do? If it's a good idea, it should get funded, right? Uh, no. <laughs> and part of the reason is that, you know, when you think about, oh, well, what, I, what do I really want to do? you start imagining this thing that has all these bells and whistles, all the different projects, all the different possibilities. And it's like this one episode of The Simpsons where um, Homer Simpson is allowed to design his own car and he ends up designing this, this monster um, because he's able to do everything that he wants. Um, and instead what you wanna do is focus on that grant that does the one or two things that it says it's going to do and it does it well, right? And it doesn't have all those bells and whistles, but it's a, an efficiently you know, run machine that's going to accomplish the tasks that you set forth. Um, of course, the science is going to evolve and be probably different than what you propose, but at least it tells reviewers that you understand how to focus on a particular question and answer it in the most effective way. And during that time, we had our third daughter, our second daughter, our third child, uh, Elizabeth. Okay, so being at a research institute gave me a little bit of extra time to, to do things uh, on the side. So I worked with uh, ASPB and, and others um, to um, uh, work on science policy with the science policy committee. I had put together a, a petition for plant scientists to show support for uh, uh, genetic modification technology in crops. Um, and then I worked with, with NASC to help to, to set up a symposium uh, to uh, under, understand how to best do outreach so that we could be a more effective community in engaging with, with others. Um, and this was uh, in no, no small part uh, facilitated uh, and, and co-led by uh, Joanna Friesner, uh, who's in the picture. But during this time, the country uh, went, has you know, been going through tremendous cultural um, and political changes. Um, and these were terribly disturbing to me. Um, and so I was at a research institute, but I really had no role in education. Um, and I had no role really in administration either uh, and in helping to you know, manage the system. And I realized that you know, what Trump ultimately represented was our own failing as a country to properly educate our population. And so I decided to go on the job hunt and search for a position at a university so that I could play a role in education uh, and improving mentorship and improving the system um, in a way that I couldn't do at a research institute. So now I'm at Stanford and you know, one could say that you know, I've, I've climbed to the top of the ivory tower. Um, since being at Stanford, you know, we've been able to accomplish all sorts of wonderful things. Um, I've been recognized uh, in, in lots of different ways that, that are honestly quite humbling. 
Um, I, I served as director of graduate studies for a program that serves over 150 people, students. Um, and, you know, I was, I've been able to mentor, uh, you know, postdocs and students in the lab that have really accomplished great things and have gone on to uh, wonderful positions in, in biotech and, and academia. And I'm really, really proud of that. And um, this is my group today. Um, they're a, a beautiful uh, set of individuals, uh, all uh, totally unique in their, in, in their passion and their research directions, um, but I think united by a shared um, uh, mutual respect uh, and appreciation for, for the beauty of, of plants. Of course, none of this is, is possible without um, my life at, at home, which influences both my, my values and, and, and how I treat other people, and, and also um, helps me to um, stay grounded and, and understand what, what really, really is important. So, you know, in last you know, sort of uh, little bits of advice, I think something that is really important for me to remember is that, you know, your life is not about you. Um, I think so much of our lives are spent trying to understand who we are, what we want to do, how we're going to make it in life. Um, and, and that's important. But at some point, that's not enough. And if I know from my own experiences that if I'm focused only on what I need and what I want, I can really spiral into, into a depression that's, that's hard to get out of. Um, and so I think it's important to, to break out of that cycle and, and to, to dedicate your life, um, not to just about understanding who you are, but in understanding how you uh, can be a force uh, for change to help others. And why? Well, you are here because of the love of many people, right? I mean, we all go through tough times, but we wouldn't be here unless someone loved us, right? We're also here in science because it helps us to know, to, to appreciate something. Like, so for me, you know, science is about, is, is valuable to me because it helps me to understand the origins of beauty in my world. Um, and so, you know, rather than focus on, you know, well, why am I here? Do I belong here? Do I belong at Stanford? Goodness sakes, right? Those are really tough questions that really focus only on me. Instead, I try to put that aside and say, well, rather than constantly question whether I actually belong here, I'm going to consider this experience a gift. Now, I'm a person of faith. I, I, I attribute that gift to, to um, God and the world around me, but um, it's a gift. And, and to pay, and, and what, what's important to me then is, is that what I can do is rather than ask, do I deserve that gift? Gifts are not deserved, right? Instead, I'm going to use that gift. I'm going to use that gift to pay it forward, right? To help other people uh, achieve things that are of value to them. And, and if I can do that, then in some ways I've, I've earned my, my right to have that gift or I've, 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 I've done more with that gift than just keep it to myself. Okay, so that's enough about me and my presentation. Uh, sorry, it took uh, quite a while, um, but I'm really happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Jose, that was wonderful. Um, I really loved the, the um, lesson that you provided at the end. And um, I'm still thinking, I'm just still thinking about that, about considering your experience as a gift. And I, I, I do, that does resonate. I, I do love to help people. And I, that really comes through. Um, there was so many twists and turns in your story. I was not expecting <laughs> where you were gonna start and end. Um, and I was really struck by all the people in your journey that affected you. Um, the, the variety of mentors and models. I mean, that was, I, I didn't think of it before, but it is also a gift who, who you work with and who uh, gives you the gift of feedback and mentoring and just the unique ways that you incorporated these lessons and cultivated your own story. It's, it's really an inspiration. So thank you so much. Um, we do have like 15 minutes or so. And so I do want to um, I hope I've had the chat appropriately set up so people could write questions. It's possible I turned it off. Let me just check here. No, I do have it. Okay, so uh, as people are thinking about questions, I wanna just look at some of the ones that were submitted. 
Uh, I see one of them was already answered. So I'll, I will ask one question about that. So somebody asked why you took your job in Asia, which you answered. And, um, but a part of that question is, would you recommend this to others looking for their first faculty position? So if you're say coming from the US, um, you know, are there, are there good Asian countries that could be a stepping stone for faculty positions in the US or Europe? Or, or I guess maybe a more general question is just sort of, you know, going, leaving and going to other countries as, as, part of your, as part of your journey. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think, you know, as Americans, um, we, we don't have as much, you know, collective experience living abroad, um, but getting that experience um, really, you know, sort of sets you apart and, and also gives you uh, a life experience that, that you'll value uh, forever. Um, so I, I definitely think it's it, it's something that I I I would you know do again. Uh, I, I actually was excited to to go to Germany, for example, with my with with Detlef, um, and so I was happy to finally get that opportunity to live abroad uh, when I did so uh, to to Singapore. Um, certainly, you know, uh, uh, Singapore is is a wonderful location today. Lots of exciting plant science going on there. They're hosting. Um, a, a early career uh, symposium uh, for for plant science as well. So they're they're trying to uh, encourage uh, plant research. Um, so yeah, I, I I would encourage it. I did it, of course, and I've you know each of these different moves was really informed by what made sense for my family. And so you know, would I have gone to Singapore if it wasn't for for my partner? No, I wouldn't have probably made that choice. Um, and so I think it's really, you know, important to for, for folks to, to think about what makes sense for their, their families, their partners, or, or anyone else that's, that's dear to them. So it is an opportunity that, that some people um, will make sense for some people, but others, uh, it, it may not be in the cards, and that's fine. I think overall, what I'd like to communicate is that, you know, while it looks like I've made this sort of uh, path based on all the right choices, um, the, the real only right choice was doing it, you know, to, to support my family. Um, and then everything else sort of um, uh, coincided with that. Wonderful. Um, I, here's a submitted question. Um, and I think you're, I think you'd be really poised to answer this, at least based on my experience with you is, uh, do you have suggestions on dealing with the, the question says politics and science um, without losing your temper and morals. And so I, I'm not sure what exactly politics covers there, but uh, I think it could, it could run across a lot of things that happen in academia from admin to, to publishing to grants. So I don't know if you wanna take a stab at that. Yeah, so the, the first thing is at least in terms of, you know, how I try to treat other people, uh, I try to come to every uh, interaction Believing that the other person is is trying to do their best, right? Because if if we if we assume that, which is actually true most of the time, right? Most of the time we are really trying to bring our best in, and if we're not, you know, accomplishing what we need to, um, it's because you know we need better strategies. Uh, but it's not because someone else isn't trying hard. So that's the first thing I do is I assume everyone is is is, is bringing their best, um, and that I think helps helps a lot of the time. Uh, because people want to feel appreciated and, and it's often when they don't feel appreciated or they have any fear that that bad uh, interactions can, can arise but there are also bad actors in the situation there are there are bullies um particularly uh, i've experienced in a kind of a high stakes environment like stanford um and it's hard I'd, I'd say, you know, I've, I've had, you know, hours of therapy to, to, to go over, you know, some of these conversations that I've had with folks and, and to get through the other end uh, with, with some sort of, you know, self-value um, still intact. Um, and you're going to find those people everywhere. So I don't think it's an acad academia uh, specific thing. And I think the, the flip side, though, is that it's so easy sometimes to get hung up on those few individuals that really, you know, rile you up. And, you know, when I think about that, I think, well, what about all those other people around me, right? That are really beautiful and valuable people. Um, and when I start to focus on that instead about the good that exists there, then, then I can, I can, um, 
I can feel comfortable with, with where I am. Thank you. Um, I have another one. Uh, what is the most significant challenge you face as a PI? So it sounds like it could be a current, you know, it currently as a PI or perhaps if it's in the past as well. So I think that's changed uh, with different stages of, of my lab. Um, so I had a short postdoc, two and a half years. And so the biggest challenge when I started my lab was uh, putting together projects that, that had legs that would actually work. Um, my first graduate student, Lena Duan, um, who actually uh, moved with us from Singapore to, to Carnegie and then was also uh, continued in the lab as, as a postdoc, uh, she had a lot of failed projects in the beginning. And, you know, it was, you could see, you know, how, how much resolve she had, you know, moving through those projects. Um, but that was difficult because as a starting PI, you feel so much responsibility for the people in your lab. And so there, the hardest you know, thing was, was both feeling responsible, but actually working through it and, and coming up with the, the project ideas that worked. And it took about two and a half years before I really enjoyed being, being a PI. Um, I'd say now, the the challenge is seeing the next 20 years ahead of me and actually um, feeling like I have a, a, a full kind of career ahead of me, right? It, so much of what I've wanted to accomplish, I, I have accomplished. So what do I do next? How can I both, um, you know, uh, make sure that I'm doing everything that I can for the people in my lab uh, and, and, you know, of course, balancing that with with the challenges of, of starting to raise teenagers, uh, which is no small task, um, but also like, well, what do I want my mark to be, right, in, in the field? Um, is it gonna be through some sort of leadership, uh, outreach, do I wanna write a book? Uh, and, and so that's, I would say that's a challenge I'm still trying to work, work through. Um, and maybe, you know, it's not something that you solve right in a day, it's, it's something that you feel out over time. And, I'm kind of in this mode where I'm I'm just feeling things out and, and waiting to see um, how how my career is going to develop. Have you have you started thinking about your album you're going to make? <laughs> I know you play guitar. I've seen videos of you or pictures. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the one other realization is that I will never be good at playing these instruments. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also get incredibly nervous, um, and so. I can play pretty well on like by myself in a, in a darkened room, but uh, like I, I play um, a song for the lab during our lab retreats, and and I'm I'm it's just embarrassing, but I do it. <laughs> so uh, here's a question: Did plants play any role in your life before you got into plant research? Were you interested in botany growing up, or or did that sort of come in later on? Yeah, I think the, the the general interest in and, and love of, of the beauty of nature, right, was there. Uh, my father, as I mentioned, was really interested in the outdoors, and 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 later on, when he was out of prison, I'd, I'd visit him in upstate New York and, and go on hikes, and, and that was really valuable. Um, I think also when I was at Berkeley, the, the big switch to plant biology came when I realized that all the students in my molecular cell biology classes. Um, they were pre-med and, and they weren't really interested in the material in the same way that I was. And so I wanted to find a major where <laughs> everyone taking it was interested in the material. And you don't do plant biology unless you're really interested in plants, right? It's not because of the fame. It's not the money. It's a sincere love of, of the organism. And so I think all of us plant biologists really have a, a beautiful, um, you know, sort of common... Um, you know, aspect of our personalities that that we're really in it because of 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 the beauty of the organism, and so that's that that's where I I made my switch. Um, I'm also incredibly. Um, uh, I also think it's wonderful how society has used you know plants um, uh, to, to to benefit uh, you know um, feeding people and culture and, and, and art and things like that. Um, you know that Mexicans and as well as you know every culture on Earth has contributed to the plants that we have through domestication. So it's a wonderful kind of global community that exists uh, with plants. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. 
So I'll take uh, the moderator's prerogative for just a second to ask my own question, since um, this is something I've thought about for many years is, uh, I, I worked in the past in uh, with academics working on sustainability and agriculture. And when I when I was doing these jobs, I, I had these two threads. I had my whole Arabidopsis molecular biology group of people, including you in the past. And then I had these people working more on sustainability. And this spanned from, it basically spanned most everything, but not so much molecular biology. And between these two, world, I really started thinking about the need, the really the need for, for, it, for our work and our view to span everything. And I found a lot of people in molecular biology, I don't want to say they were myopic, but they were very focused on sort of what you could do in the lab and okay, maybe field trials, but it's really like, how did everything work? And then in the other group, the sustainable agriculture, it was very much, you know, uh, you know, it, it, the uh, environment and people and how to you know sustain groups, but there wasn't really a crossover. And I think that's really becoming obvious about how valuable the span has to be to, to address challenges like climate change. You know, we really can't just do one or the other. And so I think molecular biologists have to think about the environment much more. They have to think about the effects on people around the world. And so I wonder what you think about the future of of how to kind of span these disciplines and span these various groups so that our molecular biology group can kind of think more about indigenous peoples and, and how we you know, grow food and, and, and how we adapt and things like that, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. So I, I think, it, I think it's, it's a, uh, that we're experiencing a culture change naturally. Um, so you know, when I started uh, in plant biology, you know, I'd, I'd hear multiple times of people saying, you know, you shouldn't think at all about application of your work. So there was, you know, active discouragement uh, of, of think of, of of that sort of science. And in fact, uh, you know, there would there would be concern if you were thinking in, in too much of an applied way. I remember when I moved from studying just you know basic development uh, in in plants to studying this intersection between development and stress that I had people asking me, well, are you, are you doing that just because you want money so you can do application uh, a, a, as well? Um, I was doing it because I thought that's where the most important questions uh, were, were going to be. And, and, but I, I see that changing. I, you know, young people coming into the lab are definitely influenced by you know, the, the, circum, the, the dire circumstances that we're living in. And I think you know the uh, certainly at a place like Stanford, uh, you know one of the things I value is that they they value purposeful knowledge, right? It's it, we're you know we're um, learning things to to have an impact, and I think that's then a perfect place for plant biology because there's there's no part of the plant that you can study that doesn't have a potential application, right? Like I always tell you know. People, well, you know, okay, leaves, leaves have hairs, right? Okay, well, what use is a leaf hair? Well, uh, the, the hairs on, on, on seeds are what makes cotton. Um, the hairs in, in a citrus fruit, that's what contains the juice, right? Hairs on cannabis, that's where the oils are, right? There's so many ways that hairs are going to influence, you know, medicine, uh, material science, uh, you know, you name it. And that's just a hair on a leaf, right? There's so much that we can, we can learn about plants that have, has application. And now that biotechnology is making it easier for small companies to have an impact right in this area, I think I, I'm hoping that more and more students will see, um, you know, a career, a career in, in, in plant biotechnology as being the place that they want to be. And, and then it's you know, up to us in academia to, to develop training programs so that we can um, you know, train folks that, that know not only how to answer a basic question, but to know how to apply that uh, in an agricultural context. So I think both of those are now important. And I think much more valued than, than certainly when, when we were uh, students. Totally agree. There, I've got two more questions. I think one will be short, so I'll start with that, and then one might be a little bit longer. So the first one that um, might be shorter is: uh, Have all of your research projects idea research project ideas gotten funded? 
or did you have to abandon some ideas because funding agencies just didn't want to support them? Yeah, so uh, no, not all of my ideas uh, have been supported. Uh, and, and at least one of, I, I would say the two projects, well, the, the one main project that was uh, not funded uh, is this project uh, on, on this process called hydro patterning. Um, so it's one of these processes by which the plant is able to sense water, and then it activates uh, root branches in regions that are in contact with water. So really fundamental, important, provides, you know, a new, uh, I think changes our way uh, of, of seeing, you know, how, how plants sort of view their own worlds and, and provides a model for, for studying this process of, of moisture sensing. So I think it has, you know, um, uh, important um, connections to, to all sorts of fundamental biology. I've never gotten it funded once. And I applied for grants from NSF and USDA, I think six times is now the, the final total. Um, in the meantime, we've, we've published uh, uh, multiple papers on, on the subject. We, we've done a GWAS in maize uh, and I've supported it through by hook and by crook, <laughs> basically uh, to move the project forward. So I didn't, I didn't listen to the reviewers in, in that sense because I knew it was an important project. Um, but that, you know, of course, that's that's not always possible. And projects do off, you know, sometimes get dropped because because of funding. Um, I would I advise, you know, uh, starting off PIs, you know, if they've had some difficulty getting a project funded, um, you know, look into collaborative situations where perhaps uh, you can uh, join a collaborative group where that you know, that project makes sense. And so, you know, um, and then, then the uh, kind of the stringency of, by which that project is viewed might be, might be a little bit different in the context of a collaborative project. That's great advice. Um, and I think I'll just go with the last question, the one that's been in my box for a while. Um, you mentioned that Trumpism, I mean, I don't think you actually said his name, but you mentioned that uh, politics that happened in the US a few years ago motivated you to want to move to Stanford or to some university setting so that you could contribute to a broader education of students. And the question is, are you able to do this through teaching plant science? And if so, what are your strategies? Yeah, so, you know, first of course, at, at the university, I played an administrative role as director of graduate studies. And so that for me was a really important way that I could uh, impact um, the, the the community independent of the specific field of, of, of plant science. Um, but I just got done this quarter teaching uh, a physiology class. Uh, it's a team taught course and my part is um, some general aspects of physiology, but also plant plant biology. And it's a challenge to uh, uh, excite, you know, pre-med students uh, about plants. And, you know, I've taught it six times now and and I think I've, I've gotten better at it over time, but, but it is, is difficult. But I think if, you know, because often um, these students, you know, they're coming into Stanford, you, you might imagine all sorts of things about their background education, but it's actually very, very disparate and, and very few of them know really anything fundamental about plants. Um, so what you do is you start with something that they know, right? So, and something that they care about. And so of course, you know, they, they do care about uh, nature, they value it. They they care about the environment. They value that uh, where where things came from, life, life history. You know how did how did plants evolve on, onto land, and and how does that influence things like oxygen that that we need to breathe, and and how you know those sorts of things have changed over evolutionary time. So there there are, there are ways of connecting it, but it, but it is harder. Stanford has a small plant community. It's going to get smaller when Carnegie moves to to Caltech, um, and so I think you know. In this context as, as well, we're having to rethink, you know, what does it mean to have a plant community at Stanford? How can we um, strengthen it? And then ultimately, how, how can that community serve um, to, to educate students uh, and, and grad students on, on the value of plants? Great. Well, on, on that note, which uh, the hopeful, the hopeful uh, strategizing about how to uh, inspire as many members of future generations on the value of plants to the world. Um, I think if anybody can do it, Jose, you're 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 going to be that guy. So <laughs> I want to thank you so much for joining everybody. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we 
recorded this hopefully properly. I will check the video and make sure it's not just my face the whole time, but it was actually Jose's slides and I will um, post it to the website and share it out. So um, if everybody could join me in thanking Jose for his generous sharing of his plant biology story today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.